My name is Jacob Sherman and today is April 5th, 2010. I'm here in the OSU library visiting with Dan and Janice Bigby about their experiences with the Oklahoma State University's Ethiopia project. Today we will, we, we will primarily interview uh, Dan Bigby with his wife Janice chiming in to clarify things or just to give him some good grief. <laughs> 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 this interview is part of the O State Stories Project, of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Uh, we will. This is part one of the Big V interview on Wednesday, April seventh. We will be interviewing primarily with uh, Janice. Uh, first off, both of uh, both of you, I thank you for your participation today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Okay, Mr. Big V, can you uh, first off? Tell me where you grew up and when you were born, and oh. primarily about your early life. Okay. Well, uh, I was born in Walters, Oklahoma, down in Cotton County, on April the 16th, 1930. Well, happy early birthday to you. <laughs> yeah, we're getting close. <laughs> so uh, you're going to be 80 then? I'll be 80, yeah. And... Uh, 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 well, uh, I grew up in Walters and, and uh, attended school there, and um, um, I, well, of course, I had odd jobs around the community and that sort of thing as I uh, grew up and uh, saved some of my money so I could go to college, and, and uh, I started out at uh, Cameron and Lawton, which at that time was part of the A&M system mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at the conclusion of my two years there uh, uh, I got married and was uh, uh, called up for the Korean conflict with the 45th division uh, and so I had three years with the military uh, intervening uh, before I actually got on campus at OSU to finish up a bachelor's degree and ultimately did a master's while I was here. What did your parents do? Well, uh, my mother was a, a county director of public welfare in uh, Oklahoma, and um, my parents were divorced at an early age, and all I know of my father is that he was a federal bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. Uh, he did spend some time in the Burma Theater uh, during World War II. How, how big was Walters at that time? Well, it had a population of about 3,000. 3,000? Yeah. And Walters is the county seat down there? Yes. So you lived in town, and maybe for those that didn't grow up or haven't seen that, can you describe what the town atmosphere was like? during that time period? Well, this was, this was depression period, uh, and um, it's a small town, uh, an agricultural community, so a lot of the business was um, uh, agriculturally oriented, and we had a lot of, of uh, equipment dealerships uh, at that time. We had, uh, I think it was three, maybe four grocery stores, and there were two dry goods stores, and a bank, and, and uh, uh, two drug stores, and a five and dime store, and we had a, a, a theater, a movie house, and uh, it just, uh, oh yeah, there was two movie houses. One of them didn't operate much, though. Uh, so, uh, just a, a small agricultural community uh, in the 1930s. Uh, we still had uh, uh, horse-drawn wagons coming into town on Saturday, and uh, uh, the livestock sale was right up in the middle of town, and, and uh, uh, it, well, just the typical sort of thing of the of the nineteen thirties. Mm -hmm. What yeah. did, what kinds of things did you do for entertainment? 
Uh, well, as a, as a small kid, we just uh, played the usual uh, side yard games of football or basketball or kick the can or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Uh, as we got on into high school, uh, there were uh, church activities, mm -hmm. um, going to the movies, uh, going to the high school athletic events, uh, things like that. And uh, sometimes it was a big event to go off to Lawton or up to Oklahoma City to go to the movies or some event that was coming off at that time. But uh, by and large, we entertained ourselves. And, and of course, uh, in the afternoons, you always had the the Captain Midnight and Superman and Little Orphan Annie and all of that sort of thing on the, uh, on the radio. And then uh, at night, why well, you'd have uh, uh, Bob Hope or uh, Bing Crosby or Jack Benny or <laughs> the Fields Photometry and his all girl orchestra <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, those kinds of things that. Uh, it, well entertained us. In summertime we did a lot of sitting on the front porch and playing in the front yard at night chasing lightning bugs and and uh, just you know being relaxed and, and enjoying the evening. Did you uh, did your family own a car? Uh, yes we uh, uh, my grandfather was uh, we lived with my grandfather okay. and grandmother and he was a stone cutter, uh, basically with uh, tombstones and that sort of thing. So he traveled the countryside uh, with his business. And then my mother, as a social worker, had to uh, visit people in their homes and so forth around the county, and so uh, she had an automobile. Mm -hmm. What kind of vehicles were they? Well, my mother had a uh, 1936 Chevrolet sedan and my granddad when we first went to live with him he had a, a, a Model T coupe and then later traded that for a Model A for mm -hmm. Model A and uh, stepping up there it's stepping up a little bit and then I guess when he died he was driving a, a, a Chevrolet coupe would have been an early 1930s model, uh, Chevrolet Coupe. Did you have any brothers and sisters? I had one brother younger than I, by about 15 months. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you two get along? Or? Yeah, we got along all right, although uh, we were not buddies in the sense that you often think of, of brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, as young kids, we... Uh, we played together a lot around the the home, but uh, we had a lot of chores to do, and um, so uh, we didn't we didn't play all the time. Uh, then, as we got older, uh, he was more of an outdoors type, and and he liked to hunt and fish, and and. Uh, he was much bigger than I, and, and so he was athletic and, and played sports that I didn't do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, we didn't, well, we weren't buddies, uh, I'll put it that way. But Two different personalities? But, yeah, two different personalities. He much more introverted than I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so... Um, but yeah, we uh, we were in the National Guard together, and we both went off to the uh, with the 45th when it was activated in 1950. Mm -hmm. Although we were in uh, we were in the same company, but we were in different platoons, and and so uh, we didn't see each other all that often uh, when we were in the army. Mm -hmm. But uh, in uh, in a lot of ways, uh, my brother was my hero, so. But, uh, That's good. Yeah. Do you remember 
aspects of the depression at all? Like what what you had to deal what you had to deal with to cope during that time period or Well, my my mother was the primary cash income earner mm -hmm. with her job. Uh, my grandparents owned four city lots, uh, not blocks, but lots. And the house sat on one lot, uh, the side yard was the second lot, and then the back two lots were really farmed. And so we had a, a big garden, uh, we had a, a chicken house, uh, we kept goats and rabbits. Um, we had a little four tree peach orchard mm -hmm. and a nice asparagus bed. Uh, and uh, we spent um, the, the warm seasons of the year uh, working the garden and canning. I remember uh, a lot of our summers as kids. Uh, we sat out there with our grandmother particularly, uh, well, peeling peaches, snapping beans, mm -hmm. shelling peas, um, uh, whatever, uh, canning so that we'd have food in the wintertime. Uh, and of course we, we had straight run uh, chickens and so we'd uh, uh, just as the as the male chickens matured, they started being Sunday dinner, and that was my brother and I. That was one of our jobs was to pluck the chickens. We pluck didn't have chicken. to finish dressing them, but we had to we had to kill them and pluck them. Uh, and then we kept care of the rabbits and and that sort of thing. And when uh, the litter got big enough, why well, we started eating fried rabbit instead of fried chicken. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, in the winter time, uh, we, we had to take care of the animals, uh, but we also had to see to keeping wood in the wood box because we burned wood and uh, didn't, uh, we had some gas in the house uh, and that was used on the cook stove, but the house was heated by uh, wood. And usually we just closed up all of the house except the, what we call the dining room and the, and the kitchen. Uh, and uh, you got a bath, certainly on Saturday, sometimes in the middle of the week, and then you just heated water on the stove and put it in a wash tub in the middle of the kitchen floor and and you kind of took your chances as whether you got to use the water first or not <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that kind of thing uh, but that was pretty much the the way that that we got through the depression years mm -hmm. uh, of course the dust bowl came along and, and uh, although we weren't affected nearly as badly as, as some of the folks further west and north of us, uh, still those big old dust clouds would come in and, and dust would just be on everything and in everything and around everything for two or three days yes. until it would blow through. Uh, and uh, I remember trying by stuffing rags around the windows and in the doors and that sort of thing to kind of keep it out of the house, uh, but you know, days on end, all you could see was a kind of a little red ball up there through the dust cloud mm -hmm. that was the sun. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and the drought that went along with that, of course, was very bad. Uh, another aspect of Walters was we had a, we had a very active WPA mm -hmm. uh, program in the county and uh, so they built a lot of, of farm to market roads and, and uh, um, they built the dam for the local lake and, and uh, a number of other public works in the, in the area. 
And that went on for several years, as well as a lot of young men went off to the CCC, mm -hmm. and they worked in the camps up around the Wichita Mountains, mm -hmm. and fixing the parks and so forth that are in recreation facilities that are there now. Did you, did the war transform life in Walters at all? Oh yeah, um, that was a, that was a whole new thing. Uh, I worked in a drugstore uh, during part of that time and we had the, we had the telegraph office. Mm. And one of my duties was to carry telegrams out to homes. Uh, but when one of the casualty telegrams came in, I remember my boss always took those out to the home. Uh, then rationing was, uh, uh, that was a whole different culture. Um, you had, you didn't have just one ration book. You had ration books for this and ration books for that and whatever. And, and uh, each member of the family got, mm -hmm. depending upon their age and so forth, got various ration books mm -hmm. for, you know, shoes or clothing. And I know for the cars, uh, rationing for the tires and... Uh, Gasoline was rationed, and uh, I know in the dr drugstore, uh, tobacco was rationed, and uh, there were favored clients, particularly for the cigars, because they'd be kind of scarce, and so you'd save back certain brands of cigars or whatnot for certain uh, customers. We had the bus station, and, and uh, so there'd be people coming through uh, on the bus and then a lot of bus travel uh, at that time. And uh, we could only go 35 miles an hour on the speed limit down the road. And we made several trips out to relatives in New Mexico. And if you can imagine in the 1930s or 40s in, in this case, uh, going out through West Texas on those old uh, uh, asphalt highways in the summertime yeah. and the way. wind is blowing and then you know the world is goes on forever and at 35 miles an hour it really does go on forever but <laughs> you know lo and behold even at that we could drive from Walters to down into the southeast corner of New Mexico in one day but we started awful early and it was dark when we got there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it uh, it affected everything. And uh, Yes, you, you can chime in. You want to say something? Or are you telling me to? When the, um, when you were activated. Oh, you're talking about the Korean thing. It took 19 of our young people which was a lot for Walters. Yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, we had, you know, of course there were draftees and, and so forth during World War II. And uh, one occasion I remember uh, uh, one of the families, their son was a pilot, mm -hmm. a bomber pilot. That's and, a dangerous job. I'm sorry? That's a dangerous oh, job. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, he was having to, to fly from one location to another location, and Walters was uh, uh, along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and they gave him permission, and he came in, and, and he buzzed the town two or three <laughs> times. <laughs> and, but we knew he was coming, and so yes. uh, people were already out kind of looking for him. And so when he did come, why I'm, people were out in their yards and in the streets and whatnot, waving at him, and then he gave us a good show. <laughs> nice. And uh, soldiers had returned from combat on leave, 
uh, recuperation and uh, they'd come visit the schools and, and relate their uh, experiences and I remember one uh, marine fellow uh, can't think of his name now but he'd been on Guadalcanal mm. and that was a terribly hard fought battle in the early part of the war and uh, he was telling of his experiences in the jungle and, and uh, how bad it had been and, and uh, the, the hot moist climate and, and uh, all of those things that make life miserable in a combat or in the army I don't care whether it's yeah. combat or not <laughs> how did uh how did you hear about Pearl Harbor? Do you remember that day at all? Or? Oh, I remember that day. Uh, I guess that I heard about it as um, we were playing in the yard and, and uh, my parents called us into the house to to listen on the radio as things were going on at that time. I was 11 years old at the time, and uh, and even at that age, I was already listening to the news with mm -hmm. some interest and, and uh, was aware that things with Japan were yeah. tense and uh, and so forth, but yeah, it would have been, you know, around early afternoon, uh, and I'm I'm pretty certain my brother and I were out in the yard somewhere or another, and then we were called into the house to listen to it. I know that we didn't listen to it too terribly long. We went on about our business, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I guess. I look back on it in some way. It was a terrible thing, but uh, I think there was a little bit of, of release of tension and, and so forth, at least within my family and uh, neighbors and that sort of thing that, well, you know, we're not just, you know, waiting anymore. We're in it now. And uh, but very apprehensive because the the attack on Pearl Harbor and the, and the subsequent days with the attacks in the Philippines and what is now Indonesia and uh, Southeast Asia uh, and really the war going very badly at that time uh, it was. Uh, it was scary, and um, well, now, yeah, it was. It did was you scary. follow the events of the war? Did you follow? Oh the yeah, events? like I, I think that the best geography lesson that I ever got was uh, the was the war. Listening to the uh, the news reports and. Um, it involving you know practically all of mm -hmm. uh, of Europe and the Pacific Rim and and that sort of thing, uh, and in the Mediterranean area, uh, I got to know a lot about uh, Africa and Europe and and uh, Asia, mm -hmm. and that, I depend on that geography lesson even today. Now, do you like, like, do you remember particular battles? Like, do you remember like hearing about the like Jimmy Doolittle's raid or? Oh, that was an exciting thing. Really? Oh, you bet. And and uh, the newsreels at the movie showing them with those B twenty fives taken off of those aircraft carriers. Oh man, that was that was great <laughs> stuff. And um, yeah, that, that was a. Uh, that was one of the first really big morale builders, mm -hmm. I, I think, for the country. Uh, it, it was um, 
uh, kind of a show thing, uh, that it was really a, a serious attack on the country. Uh, we realized that, but we also realized that, well, uh, the, you know, the Japanese have been hitting us pretty hard with their F aircraft carriers and so forth in the Pacific, but we could reach them. Mm -hmm. And that was a that was a big boost. And um, what about uh, D Day? What what like D Day? Yes, Overlord. Yeah. Do you do you uh, remember like there was was there like an apprehension about it or? Well, it was it it was happening. It wasn't something that we could uh, we could anticipate that you know it was going to happen now. Uh, but uh, we knew that that it was coming, and when they announced it, uh, there was um, there was a lifting, I think. But at the same time, uh, there was great dread. Mm. The news coming from. Normandy was mixed. Uh, we did get through the first day mm -hmm. uh, and we're still on the beaches, uh, but the, the casualty toll was, uh, well, horrible. And uh, much anticipation, particularly on the part of those families in the community that had uh, uh, soldiers in the invasion and waiting to hear uh, whether they had survived the, mm. the initial uh, attack or not was a, a very anxious time for everybody. Uh, my family directly did not have anyone uh, in the war other than I knew that my father was in the Burma theater but he was not involved in a combat situation um, but there were you know neighbors that had uh, people uh, in the army we had neighbors whose children had been captured by the Japanese in the very early part of the war and, and you know it, it was a very hard time for them um, and most of those as I recall did come home uh, but we had casualties and, uh, of, uh, it's interesting now uh, there's a community in Virginia, Bedford, and there were 19, as I recall, there were 19 um, they were National the Guard people that had been called up um, before the war actually got started, and, but we had started um, activating mm -hmm. units and so forth. And that particular company uh, uh, made up of, of those people from Bedford, uh, the, they were the first ones on the beach at Normandy. And 19 of those young men were killed mm -hmm. in that assault. And uh, the National D-Day uh, Monument or Memorial is in Bedford, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Very nice memorial, and, and uh, uh, but it it depicts uh, the landing at, at uh, on Omaha Beach. But that town sustained the most casualties of any town in the United States on D-Day. Mm -hmm. And that was that's an interesting fact, and, and we've had opportunity to visit that mm -hmm. memorial. Mm -hmm. 
at because you serve, do you have a greater pre- appreciation of what those who served in World War Two did? Or how, how do you view their service to their country? Well, I guess I look at it um, um, Korea and World War II were the last good wars that the United States has fought. I mean, there was a real purpose there uh, beyond just uh, materialism. Uh, there was, you know, as I look at, at involvement in, in the Korean thing, yeah, the, the North Koreans came down and invaded South Korea in the same way that Germany had and Japan had gone to war in, in World War Two, you know, with the sole purpose of occupying and, and subjugating uh, those peoples. And um, I still feel that we were justified in doing what we did. And I think Korea also was good from the standpoint that it was the first time that the United Nations um, really came together as United Nations uh, to try to rectify uh, an international wrong. Uh, we haven't been very successful at that, although they've been UN sponsored. I don't think we've been nearly as su successful uh, with that as we were with uh, the Korean situation. At least we brought that back to mm -hmm. the status quo at, to some extent. And, uh, but World War II, I feel like that I was aware before a lot of the media indicate at this point that something was terribly wrong with the German regime, particularly in Eastern Europe as they uh, attacked Russia. Uh, and we were aware of concentration camps. Now, I don't know that we were as well aware of the uh, of the genocide that was going on, or the extent to which it was going on, uh, but we were aware before uh, uh, the U.S. and the Allies mm -hmm. began to liberate the the concentration camps in Germany and Eastern Europe. Uh, we were aware of the deportations and all of those kinds of things, and that you know, something was terribly wrong. Uh, but yeah, uh, if there is such a thing, uh, I think that's, uh, that's the last war that we've been involved in that really had some moral basis. Now, how did how did the Walters celebrate the end of the war? Was there a great celebration? No, I don't recall parades or. I think that there were probably some church gatherings, mm -hmm. and some prayer meetings, uh, but there wasn't any great public display of jubilation and so forth. Uh, I think that there probably was uh, a little less stress in people's voices as they greeted one another. Uh, there was probably a lifting of the spirit uh, of the community. 
and that sort of thing. Uh, but life kind of just kept going uh, with um, VE Day. We still knew that there was Japan mm -hmm. to deal with, and uh, but certainly there was a, there was a quiet jubilation in the town. But we didn't do any great big public display of any kind to uh, celebrate that. All right. Now, you, what year did you graduate high school? 1948. How big was your graduating class? Well, at that time, it was the largest class that ever graduated from Walters High School, and there were 61 of us. <laughs> what, what was your uh, high school's mascot? The Blue Devils. The Blue Devils? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious. Just curious. Yeah. <laughs> now, when did when were you called up? Were you drafted? Or? Well, our unit was was what was called federalized. We were Oklahoma National Guard, mm -hmm. and that was the the 45th Infantry Division. Yes. And so we were federalized, and by that we were brought in under uh, Army command now rather than state command and uh, did you volunteer for that service oh yeah okay you the, the National Guard is all volunteer but you are signed up for certain periods of time just like you were drafted or mm -hmm. or whatever and, and so uh, you were you were obligated to go yes unless uh, you were declared physically unfit or whatever uh, you went just like any other draftee would go, mm -hmm. and then the unit was filled up with draftees and prepared for uh, action in Korea. Now, what made uh, you decide to volunteer for the National Guard? That's a really good question. I look back Money. on it now, <laughs> and I guess it, it really was money as much as anything. Uh, it, it was not a great act of patriotism, I'll put it that way. Okay. <laughs> uh, back at that time, you, you had to drill once a week, I think it was, mm -hmm. and for two hours, and you got a full day's pay for whatever your military grade was. And um, so, uh, yeah, it gave me pocket money. Uh, and let's see, I guess I probably joined in 1947. I was still in high school. Still in high school? At the time that I joined. Uh, and I just continued participating as I went on to college because it was, it was providing income to support college and, mm -hmm. and actually uh, even after my Korean experience, I rejoined the National Guard for that reason. It supported my education. Now, do you want to discuss briefly about your participation in the Korean conflict, or that's up to you? Uh, I was a non-combatant, okay. and uh, but I I trained to go into. Uh, 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 Korea with my unit and I was a squad leader and um, I decided to come back and go to to uh, OCS and so uh, I spent some time at Fort Benning and I was also on the staff of the infantry school detachment at Fort Benning until my uh, discharge. And. Uh you were discharged when? In May of 1953. And you made the decision at that point to go to college? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, Janice has a, a, a farm down in Comanche County, and, and we really had thought that we might farm. But when we actually got home and began to look at, at 
arrangements, it was going to be another year before we could actually plant a crop because uh, 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 the current lease man had a contract for the land up until that time. And I was casting about for, well, you know, what do I do with myself in the interim? And I thought, well, I've got GI Bill. And as well use it, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so I just decided I'd go back to college, and, and things just evolved from there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that um, I ultimately finished with a, a doctorate from Michigan State, and, and uh, then went to Ethiopia mm -hmm. for a while. Well, let's back up a little. How did you meet your wife? How did I meet my wife? Well, there are two stories. There's mine and there's hers. <laughs> <laughs> can we can we get yours? Today? Yeah, and you can her. get mine today. You uh, can get hers another time. <laughs> that's right. But uh, Temple and Walters were rival high schools. And uh, she attended Temple, and I and my brother attended Walters. And... My brother was playing on the Walters football team, and uh, some of her cousins, who I went to Cameron with, uh, we'd always come home for the football games, and, and we had the annual Walters-Temple rivalry at Walters this particular year, and, and one of her cousins and I, uh, at that time, kind of traditionally carried the the yard markers at the on the sideline, and uh, so at halftime, he and I were just standing there leaning on our sticks, and this pretty little thing just came kind of dancing across the field and <laughs> up to us, and and she was coming to greet her cousin, and so that's how I met her. Right. Yeah, I was I became a Comanche captive right there. <laughs> you bought me a cup of coffee. Well, yeah, I could have. I could very well have done that too. But, <laughs> but I still have a vision of her dancing across that field to to talk to her cousin. And when did you guys marry? In August of 1950. So you're working on 60 years? Yep. It'll be 60 years in August of this year. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Now, We're rather proud of that. <laughs> that's good. Um, all right. So you went to Cameron for two years, right? Yes. And you got your associates there? Or well, I didn't. I chose not to take the, the certificate. Uh because my intentions were at the time that I was going right on for a bachelor's degree, and uh, then the Army intervened, or the Korean conflict intervened <laughs> before I got here. <laughs> and once you were discharged, you made the decision to come up to Stillwater? Can you uh, yes. describe campus, what it was like back then, at that time? I know you were talking about earlier that the library was just been built, so. Well, um, I guess at that time, Love Library had not yet, or not Love, but a low library had not really opened when I came in 1953. Um, but the structure was up and the internal fixtures and so forth were being completed. So it did, uh, uh, we had a nice big grand opening and so forth for the library uh, not too long, I guess, after I arrived on campus. Uh, the poultry farm uh, sat uh, in the area where Ag Hall now sits. Uh, that old dairy building that 
they tore down, I guess, this last year or so when they started mm -hmm. putting up a, a research laboratory facility there. Uh, I guess it's uh, one of the last buildings, old ag buildings at any rate, to still be around when we moved back in, in 95. Uh, the union was new, but had been open for some time, and uh, back then uh, the union cafeteria was one of the best places in town to eat, and uh, a lot of people in the community would uh, go to the union for Sunday dinner. That's I've heard those stories. Yeah. Very formalized dinners. Yeah. Um, Did you participate in any, any student activities? Uh, not really. I, I participated in the um, in the poultry club, and I was invited to join the Alpha Zeta, which is an ag honorary. And uh, did you do ROTC or no? No. By that time, see, I was already. I had fulfilled all of my military obligation by the time that I came back to to go to school at Stillwater, so no, I never participated okay. in the ROTC. Uh, but uh, I enjoyed sports, so I, I took in the athletic events and that kind of thing. Going we to basketball were, games? Well, I'm sorry? Basketball games? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, I, I regret missing the probably the most exciting basketball game or one of the most exciting basketball games ever played on this campus and that was when Wilt Chamberlain <laughs> was at Kansas and yeah. they came down here to play and uh, uh, we beat him at the buzzer yeah. and I happened to know the guy that shot the, <laughs> the basket that won the ball game. Uh, but. Uh, I guess our, our other involvement here, we were very active with our church and in the Wesley Foundation uh, uh, at OSU. Um, but I pretty much, I guess, had my nose stuck in my books and, and uh, involved with my family and uh, uh, didn't get too terribly involved in campus life. Yes. Uh, not that I was unaware of it, but it just was not the kind of thing that, that uh, entertained us much at that time. You were an older student. I was an older student and, had a and I was, had a family. And um, so uh, I, understand. I guess the, the antics of students at that <laughs> time, such as panty raids and Whatever, or <laughs> been, you're way too mature for that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Do you uh, remember any particular professors that you worked with or under? Uh, yeah, uh, I would be remiss in not mentioning George Newell. Um, he was one of the professors in the poultry department at the time. And he kind of took me under his wing and, and uh, mentored me through um, uh, my time here at, at uh, uh, OSU and uh, encouraged me to go on to graduate school at, at uh, uh, Michigan State. And uh, he had some influence on my uh, employment at the University of Maryland where he had graduated uh, uh, I, and he certainly uh, was the major influence in getting me to participate in the Ethiopian project. How, now you came here s seeking an animal science degree. Well I came in general agriculture to start with. And did you want to go to back on the farm or start the farm or well, no, I... I was just wondering what pushed yeah. you towards the higher end, higher... Serendipity. 
uh, when I was at Cameron, um, they had a field day of the junior colleges that were affiliated with uh, the A&M system. Um, and they had judging contests and uh, other kinds of activities. And, and so the ag kids from those schools would come on campus. And uh, so my freshman year at uh, Cameron, um, uh, Kendall Bales and, and James Phillips and I made up the poultry team that came to uh, the field day, and we won the, the event. Uh, the next year, we couldn't participate in that event again, so uh, I wound up coaching the poultry team that came up from uh, Cameron and we won that one. Uh, Bill Webb and his, his twin brother, and oh. there's a fellow, his, he had flaming red hair, uh, and uh, Richardson, Red Richardson, and those guys made up the, the team that came from Cameron, and they placed, uh, I think it was third, fourth, and fifth, but there wasn't, yeah, there was 15 points that separated the low man in that group with the high man. Mm -hmm. And we won the contest. Well, when I came back to Stillwater after the Korean thing, uh, I took a poultry course the first semester that I was here. And lo and behold, the professor, uh, uh, Roberts, Cecil Roberts, remembered me. Oh, wow. And uh, so he kind of got me off on the side a few times and, and encouraged me to major in poultry. And so since poultry had been my uh, FFA project and so forth, it just kind of natural to, to go in that direction. So that's that's really how I got into poultry. Uh, I can't say that I started here with any specific goal in mind other than a degree in agriculture. Yes, ma'am? When was uh, Fred Harris in your group? That was in high school? High school, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Fred Harris was a senator from mm -hmm. Oklahoma at one time. He went to school with you? Yeah, and then Walters. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, that's that's kind of how I got started in poultry, and uh, how I got into the academic mm -hmm. line. I was looking. I was graduating. I was looking for a job, and it was Thanksgiving. And George Newell called me up at my mother's and, and said, "Hey." There's a job up in Kansas if you're going to be interested, and uh, uh, they'd like to interview you on Saturday. And this is like uh, Thursday, mm -hmm. Thanksgiving Day. And so uh, we got Thanksgiving out of the way and hopped in the car and came back. And on Saturday, I tootled up to Kansas and interviewed with these people. And, and at that time, uh, it, it was kind of normal working hours, but I thought, you know, this really isn't the kind of thing that I'm looking for, I, or I, you know, I don't see the future in this. And so I came back on Monday morning and walked into George's office, and I said, what are the chances of getting an assistant chip and going to graduate school? And he said, well, sit still for a minute. So he went in and he talked to the department head and he said, come back, we'll start you <laughs> next semester. <laughs> so that's really how I got started in the academic. And what was uh, your master's work on? Uh, I worked on, pol well really my graduate degree was in poultry products, uh, which would have been economics and processing mm -hmm. and uh, so I studied mostly economics, uh, but 
aimed at the, the marketing side of, of the poultry industry rather than the production side. But when it really got down to where I, my work took me, I wound up in production poultry. And you got your uh, PhD from Michigan State University? Yeah. yeah. And uh, with what? PhD in poultry science? Or? Yeah. With the marketing component, basically, or well, a food science. Okay. Yeah. And then you took a job at the university the, with the. Uh, I left Michigan State and went to Ethiopia. And now we're gonna discuss uh, we first the first part of the interview. We discussed his background, uh, his, his growing up, uh, stuff about the Korean and the Second World War. Now we're gonna discuss his involvement with the Ethiopian project. Um, first off, how did you get, how were you contacted and what, who contacted you about signing up and going? Okay, um, there was a, a poultry processing convention uh, conference that always met in Kansas City and, uh, and George Newell was always pretty interested in that and, and so we'd go up there or he'd take a group of us when he went up and um, so that's how I, I really wound up going to Michigan State. He introduced me to my major professor up there and, and going so when I finished up at, at uh, uh, Michigan State that conference was going on and I was looking for a job and I knew that that was a place to go so my major professor and I uh, went down to the conference and, and uh, uh, of course I knew I'd meet George Newell there but I was just anticipating talking about old times but he pulled me off to the side and, and said uh, would you be interested in going to Ethiopia and I said well yeah looking for something and said what what are you doing and he kind of described the, the activity in general and he said well if, if you're interested why I'll tell Bill Abbott who was the the um, supervisor for the the project here in Stillwater and so a few weeks later uh, uh, Abbott gave me a call and he said I'm going to be in East Lansing <laughs> And would I be willing to visit with him for a while? And, and uh, so uh, he came up, and, and uh, he spent a day with me. And um, we left uh, just kind of well. Um, I'll get back to you uh, shortly because uh, I told him, well, yeah, I'm interested, and, and uh, if. They decided I was the one that they wanted, but well, fine. And so, yeah, they called me not too long after that, and, and uh, uh, I agreed to go. Um, and that, that's, you know, pretty, pretty much it. Um, I'm, I'm glad I did. <laughs> and, <laughs> It was through my major professors that I found out about it, and it was through their support that I got the job. What was your wife's reaction? Oh, I came home, and uh, you want to tell him this? He came to the door and put down his suitcases. He said, how would you like to go to Ethiopia? I said, fine, where is it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She did the same thing to me when I went out to interview at Nebraska. <laughs> I said, where is it? <laughs> yeah, but uh, that was uh, that was her reaction, and, that's and uh, so we. I I remembered Ethiopia from World War Two, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the Emperor's plea before the the uh, United Nations. League of Nations. League of Nations, yeah. Uh, 
he had come to the to the A and M campus during the time that I was here as a student, but I I really don't remember much about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I got I can tell stories now because uh, I've heard the stories, but uh, his actual visit I don't really mm -hmm. remember much about it. I remember his visit, and they had a picture of him and. When Dan said go to Ethiopia, I thought it was in the Middle East because he had that that skin color or, or just his features. Fe features oh. To me, it looked like yeah. Arab, maybe. Mm -hmm. Did you? Did you? Uh, how was I going to phrase this question? OSU was had a presence in Ethiopia before you went in the 50s, right? Well, the project had been started back in the early 1950s. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't go until 1962. Yeah. So it had already been underway for, what, 12 years. Yeah, eight or yeah. Good decade. Years. Yeah. Years. Now, did you, did you have any professors that you worked with that went over there? when you were here or did they no did they share anything no okay I uh, other than I knew that that there was a project it had a poultry uh, element in it um, after I got there there uh, my department head uh, had been a graduate student here at the same time that mm -hmm. I was um, and who was that? That was um, oh, I'm terrible on names. Holland. Holland. Leon Holland. Okay. Now uh, what? Now some of the others had been students here too, too, but I didn't know them. Okay. What years were you in Ethiopia? 1962 to 1966. And. Who arranged for you to go over there, and what was that process like? Well, uh, all the arrangements were made through Bill Abbott's office at that time. So, you know, they they arranged for the collection of what household goods and personal effects that we were going to take over, and, and how that they were picked up and packed up and shipped off and whatever. Uh, they made the arrangements for us so that we got all of the vaccinations and they gave us what information we needed for acquisition of passports um, and it, you know, advice on uh, how to do that uh, rather than having the children on our passport. Well, we were advised to get passports for each one of us in the event that it was necessary for somebody to travel um, uh, with the children, uh, they could travel. Mm -hmm. If they were on one of our passports, why then it would kind of complicate the process. Uh, so, you know, little things like that. Uh, there was uh, some orientation from um, uh, Bill Abbott's office. Uh, I know I came up and spent a day here, I think, uh, but part of that was administrative, part of it was um, orientation and so forth, and, and learning a few things about what we need to, to do about our personal affairs and uh, things that need, we needed to be prepared for uh, when we actually arrived in Ethiopia in making arrangements with the commissary and uh, so on. Uh, but other than that, well, we were pretty wet behind the ears when we got over there. It was our first time out of the, uh, or at least Janice's first time out of the country, and my time out had been in the military, and mm -hmm. so uh, uh, that was a pretty sheltered experience. How did you feel about this? Were you what what kind of emotions were you going through as you were preparing? Were you? After I was excited. 
apprehensive, nervous? No, I I didn't have any personally. I did not have any reservations about going uh, or apprehensions about being in another country. Now, Janice has an entirely different we'll uh, impression uh, on that. Um, so, really, uh, I went with great anticipation mm -hmm. of having a, a very positive and pleasant experience. Was this, did you feel like sort of as an ad adventure? No, this is, this is not something that I felt or would have vocalized at the time mm. that we actually went to Ethiopia. Uh, but as we got there, and as I've had time to reflect on it, uh, really I think that I had uh, some sense of being a missionary. Mm. Um, we had our um, mm -hmm. we had our knowledge mm -hmm. and we had our technology mm -hmm. uh, and we were going into a, an area where people still lived in, in uh, uh, mud huts uh, in my case the, the chickens just ran around the yard uh, uh, and a, a very primitive situation. Um, and I could see us as people from the United States going into that situation. Uh, we had a uh, we had a feeling of being well. It's overblown statement, but we were going to save the world. Mm. I mean, the, you know, what we were going to do while we were there was going to change mm -hmm. uh, for the better not just overnight, but at any rate, it was, we were, we were going to be real agents of change. Uh, and that was exciting to me. Mm. Uh, I knew that I was going to encounter um, students of real ability. Um, students who were dedicated to what they were doing there. And um, that, uh, that kind of a challenge was, uh, was exciting. And it, it was exciting. Uh, but as time has gone on and so forth, I think having that that kind of zeal uh, made us uh, made us better at our job yes. than if we had been uh, uh, well, say more uh, professional about this sort of thing. Uh, it did make us excited. Yes. Not just me, but I think everybody that was there was really excited about what we were doing. Now, did but you? It was. Um, in the long run, I can't say that that was the best preparation. <laughs> 
nor was it the, the best motivation uh, for what we actually did. Um, but certainly I had a I had a vision that um, the world was going to be a better place. Now, when, when you say that, what comes to my mind is John F. Kennedy's inaugural speech, where he said, we'll go out, pay any price, pay, bear any burden, basically to change the world. Now, did that... That's a, no, that's a different thing. Mm. That's a that's a different thing entirely, but certainly more accurate than the way I felt. Okay. Okay. Uh, on reflection, uh, I consider myself a veteran of the Cold War. I was both a military soldier uh, and I was a, a, a citizen soldier. Um, from the, I think from the point of view of our politicians uh, and our government and what was going on internationally between nations uh, and the, uh, the competition uh, between um, Western capitalism and uh, uh, Russian imperialism. Uh, uh, we were soldiers in that competition. And our job was to help keep those third world nations where we were working uh, on the, the capitalistic side of the competition. And we did that. And as a result, um, yeah, um, the Russian imperialism uh, was, I, I think, really uh, doomed from the start in the way in which they went about it as compared to the way we went about it. And so, uh, yeah, we, we ultimately won that competition. But I consider myself a, a veteran of the, uh, of the Cold War as a direct participant mm -hmm. in, uh, in that competition. Where were you assigned to live and work in Ethiopia? Uh, well, I was assigned uh, to the um, uh, College of Agriculture uh, at Alamaya, uh, and we lived on their campus, or on its campus. Now, when we first arrived, uh, uh, my counterpart, who was uh, leaving, and then uh, we were coming in, we overlapped, and so the house that we would live in was occupied, and we first lived in what we call the White House downtown in Deirdala. Uh, there was another uh, project family uh, had the downstairs of, of that apartment building, and then we kept uh, or maintained as part of the project the upstairs portion for overflow and, and whatever so we overflowed into that for a couple of weeks uh, before uh, our house on campus was ready otherwise we we lived on campus and uh, as a part of the project um, the college started on a bare hillside and they had to build everything from scratch and so uh, they built the the physical plant from the, the college as well as, as housing uh, for those of us that were working there, including the, the Ethiopians. So all four years you lived on that campus? On the campus, yes. Okay. 
And it was like basically apartment style living? No. Uh, we actual they, house. Were, they were individual family homes. We had a three bedroom house you know, with a kitchen and a dining room and a living room. Did you have a caretaker? Well, we had a household staff of three. We had a cook and a mamiti and what we called a yard boy. And the cook pretty much managed the household staff. And uh, the mamiti uh, kept the house and watched the kids. And the yard boy kept the fireplace going and, and uh, kept up the yard and whatever little garden that you might have, he tended to garden. Uh, it's an interesting thing. I, I'm not much of a gardener and so he was able to do just about anything that he wanted to. And, and uh, I gave him some bell pepper seeds and he planted the bell peppers but he also planted some of his peppers along beside him and they cross pollinated. Oh, and wow. we were we were sitting there at dinner eating salad and the peppers had a little snap to them. <laughs> and come to find out he had he had planted chilies alongside my bell peppers and when they cross poll pollinated why well, the heat came <laughs> over to our side. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty good, but it was it was kind of amusing at the time. <laughs> Little surprise for you. Yeah, that was. But having a household staff is a, is a, a mixed blessing. It certainly frees you up to, with the the chores of maintaining a, a place and and uh, getting meals on the table and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but. They're human beings like everybody else, and and I always dreaded payday because my my yard boy, a nice Muslim fella, uh, but he'd go out and get drunk, and I'd have to go get him out of jail, <laughs> and it seemed like that would happen almost every payday. But uh, uh, and uh, if they had. Uh, uh, illnesses or that sort of thing why you had to see to, to getting them taken care of. I know the cook, her one time she kept saying that her daughter was very ill and then she was what 10 or 11 years old and finally one day I, uh, I think about the third day I told Janice I said well, you ought to go down there and get that girl and take her to the doctor. And lo and behold, she had typhoid. And uh, the doctor said, if you'd waited another day, we'd have never saved you. And so, you know, you have to kind of deal with those things. And uh, then, you know, whatever other idiosyncrasies that they might have. But for the most part, we had a very good staff. They were a joy to have around. And, uh, uh, were, they were very kind to us. Now, did uh, did you how how were you paid? Where did you were you able to save some for when you came back to the states? Or well, my my personal arrangements, I uh, uh, my paycheck was sent uh, to a bank in the United States where my mother lived and she could kind of keep uh, eyes on things and, and uh, uh, so we did have a, a designated amount that went into a savings account and um, then uh, we could go to the local bank and write a check uh, to get cash for local expenses and so forth. Now there were other um, allowances that were paid in local currency and uh, we received those um, locally. What activities were included with your job assignment? Did you teach? Okay. Um, 
if you're familiar with the land grant philosophy of, of um, teaching, research, and extension, um, my duties involved all three of those areas of activity. And um, so um, I taught the basic poultry production course. Uh, I also taught um, uh, a hatchery management course. Um, with my background in food science, I developed and taught a, 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 an animal uh, processing course, which was basically a slaughter and dressing of uh, livestock, um, and that included poultry. Uh, so that was pretty much my teaching regime. Um, Extension-wise, um, um, I worked with some local farmers um, and helped them begin to develop um, some income-producing poultry operations in cooperation with a, a, an ag co-op that was being developed by one of the um, ag economists there. And so the eggs that were produced from that uh, were sold through the co-op uh, to basically the, the French and the French army in Djibouti. Uh, and we could get a better price that way than if we tried to sell on the local market. Um, so that was the extension activity. Uh, the research activity, um, uh, I did the, uh, the breeding work on maintaining the, the college poultry flock. And I also did a little work uh, studying the, the local poultry and their uh, production capabilities and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was pretty much, in a nutshell, the, the general areas in which I worked. Now, of course, I had some other committee duties and whatnot, but they were rather mundane housekeeping kind of things. Okay. Who were some of the colleagues that you worked with? The what? Who were some of the colleagues that you worked with over there? The college. Colleagues. Colleagues. Oh. Well, um, of course, I worked with the other animal science people there, the dairy people and, and uh, the beef cattle. Uh, some with the agronomists from the standpoint of looking at, at uh, feed supplies and that sort of thing. But for the most part, I pretty well worked independently of, of the other uh, members of the faculty. Who? Was Dr. Kendall overseeing the Ag College at that time? Yes. Did you have much interaction with him? No. Uh, he was in administration, and um, uh, my work certainly was was not administrative in character. And what uh, administration that I had to work with usually was through my department head, and so. Um, Professionally, uh, I didn't have a lot of contact with, uh, with Dr. Kendall. Now, as a teacher, uh, I had more contact with uh, people like Leonard Miller, who was uh, the dean of students, uh, in dealing with student activities and, and needs and functions and advising and, and uh, if there were uh, issues with a, a, a student, then we'd have to deal with them that way. But by and large, that was a, that hardly ever happened. <laughs> uh, we had such good students. How many students were, would take courses under you? How many would be in your class? Well, the the poultry production class probably would run from oh, a 
around 35 to 40. Uh, the hatchery class uh, would probably be in the neighborhood of 15 to 20. And the, um, the animal processing class, uh, that was probably you know, 10 or 12 because the facility was relatively small. And, uh, and the interest in that aspect of animal science was not all that great. Being a butcher is not a high, very high position in the culture. <laughs> all right. What was the Ethiopian agriculture like when you were over there? Did you go in outside of Alamaya and help assist farmers and whatnot? Uh, what were your observations? Well, my my work dealt with only about uh, fourteen or fifteen different farmers, and and they were mixed agriculture farmers. They would have uh, poultry flocks of somewhere in the neighborhood of. Uh, two or three hundred, uh, which they kept under closed um, facilities, but still they ran free. They they ranged in a yard, but they were confined. Um, the general area uh, around the college uh, was uh, mostly uh, uh, grain sorghum and corn. Uh, vegetable crops, and then the um, uh, the real cash crop of chat, which was a it's kind of a tea plant, mm -hmm. but it has a narcotic effect, and, and uh, a lot of that is at that time was marketed uh, on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, the the soil around the uh, the college was of what's called disintegrated granite. And uh, as it lost moisture, it became pretty much a stone mm -hmm. textured and, and so forth. And so um, it did not suit itself to uh, animal power uh, as far as tillage was concerned. And so most of that was done just by hand. Do you want me to pause it? And uh, the, they just stand in a group and they had a stick with a steel point on it and a weight on one end. To, and uh, in unison, they drive that stick into the ground in a, in a circle and they turn out a clump of dirt about you know, yay big, mm -hmm. I should say soil, um, uh, about yay big, and then, you know, move on and, and flip it. And then the farmer whose land it was would come back with a, a kind of a hole-like instrument and break that up to make a, a seed bed. And then the, the seed would just broadcast and worked into the ground. Uh, and that was fairly common practice. Now, we used some mechanization and um, um, you had to, it, it was not practical in the sense of, uh, of a local farmer uh, being able to do that sort of thing. But, uh, it was mostly just subsistence farming, and um, I remember investing on farms and so forth, and then uh, going for a first time, and then getting introductions out of the way and whatnot, and then uh, the the farmer, instead of saying maybe who he was or whatnot, he might say, "Well, I belong to so and so." because the, the feudal system was still pretty prevalent in the country and uh, people were tied to the land um, on which they lived. 
it w was it still ruled by clans? The land was ruled by clans? Well, the land was, um, well, it, it, they had a very mixed land tenure system. Uh, in our area, the land would have been owned by the church. It would have been owned by noblemen. Uh, and it would have been owned by the local farmers. Uh, the church owned a lot of land in the in the country, and, and you know it was just leased out or sharecropped or whatever. Um, but still, um, under that system, most of it was. Um, um, farm in small plots. Mm. Uh, uh, a large field of say a, a quarter of a, uh, of a section in this country it would have been a huge farming operation over there. Uh, you might look at uh, there a, a big farm might have been uh, four or five hectares and, and so farming on a hectare or less was pretty common. What did you enjoy the most and enjoy the least about your assignment over there? That's a, that's a hard question because um, I just really enjoyed being in Ethiopia. The Ethiopians are very hospitable people. And um, we got to know uh, a, a number of Ethiopian families. Um, and we were, we would visit in their homes and attend their weddings and, and uh, other family events. Uh, the students, uh, we had them in our home frequently. Um, and the Ethiopian staff, um, we had a we had a very active social life with them. Um, I guess the, the one thing that gives me the most pleasure about having worked in, in Ethiopia are the, the professionals that we left behind as graduates of that institution and the successes that uh, they have had uh, over their professional life as well as in maintaining and sustaining uh, the university at, at Alamaya. Mm. Now that, I guess that if I get a warm fuzzy, that's what I get a warm fuzzy over, <laughs> all right? Uh, now, something that I disliked about the country, and that is really a hard thing. Uh, I never really had an unpleasant, really, really unpleasant experience. professionally or traveling around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and we traveled a lot of the country. And um, we were always treated uh, uh, so well. The hospitality was, you know, was so good, even from strangers. Uh, and 
and people were always willing to help if you were in trouble. Uh, I I can't really give you something okay. to say that you know this this made this was the life worst uncomfortable or it made it hard. Uh, no. Uh, I know some people would complain about the, the bureaucracy and uh, they would complain about to go to the bank, for instance, and cash a check could take all morning uh, because all of the paperwork had to be done on the processing of that check before they would pay it. And uh, oftentimes they wanted you to sit there and, and wait so that they knew you were there. At any rate, uh, some folks would look on that as uh, you know such a terrible waste of time and an imposition and this sort of thing. And at times, uh, it it would be a nuisance. But that's the way they did things. And uh, so. Uh, and, and it's their country, and it works for them. Yeah. So, you know, why should I get really upset about the way that they do things? Mm. So, no. Okay. I just had such a good time <laughs> in Ethiopia, and I've got such good friends uh, from that experience that um, that's, that's the highlight of, of my experience, was being in Ethiopia. And if I'm in a new setting or this sort of thing, um, it's always going to come out that I've been to Ethiopia and I had a good time there. And, um, it, it usually stops the conversation, but then... <laughs> that's right. But uh, that's, that's one of the most pleasant parts of, of my life. Mm. Uh, and I remember it with great fondness. Did you participate in any in American traditions? Did you celebrate the holidays while you were over there? Well, the nice thing about, this is another aspect of, of Ethiopian hospitality and generosity and, and grace. Mm. Uh, we observed all of the, of the um, Ethiopian holidays and traditions. On top of that, we had the 4th of July, Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, Halloween, Halloween. We observed all of those, not just as as the Americans that were there, but the whole campus mm -hmm. observed these holidays as well. And uh, if um, well, <laughs> um, we would have some event on campus that would have a, a social uh, activity uh, involved with it, so that there might be a reception or uh, something, and you'd always have to serve uh, refreshments of some kind. And uh, uh, the wives would always prepare things and, and at least organize this sort of thing. But within the, the, the Coptic faith, which was the, the national religion, uh, there were some 270 fast, feast, and other sort of days through the year. Um, now, that didn't mean that everything shut down on that many days, but if you had a fast day, uh, they couldn't eat um, uh, animal 
products. And so we made fast cookies. And which was a graham cracker with some margarine on it with a little sugar in it and maybe some cinnamon on it or whatnot. Well, one of the ladies, uh, and, and a note would be passed around, could you fix yeah, this or whatever? Us. And so one lady uh, who was new to the situation at any rate, she says, well, I don't have any fast recipes. <laughs> <laughs> not realizing that we yeah. were talking about uh, not <laughs> not quick but <laughs> yeah but that it was a uh, but uh, we uh, we socialized quite a bit in the community and amongst ourselves and uh, if we if we wanted to throw a, a group party, why we always invited the Ethiopian staff to come and participate with us. And so we had a we had a number of feasts and fets and dances and whatever. I, I know since uh, I handled uh, some of the processing classes and that sort of thing, We'd, uh, they were very generous as long as we kept it kind of in the back and out of sight while well, they let us race hogs because uh, pork is forbidden in their culture. And uh, so we decided that we would roast the whole pig. Well, no one had ever really done that before, but I knew some idea of what was involved with it and so we got Conrad to build us a, a pit and a big spit rack sort of thing and I got my yard boy to come down and help me and and we roasted a, a 200 pound pig. We started on that thing <laughs> almost at sun up. It finally got done enough to eat about nine o'clock that night. <laughs> but um, they they'd come and, and participate in that. Now, of course, when we had the pork, why well, they had something else. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, we'd get together for things like that, and, and uh, they they participate with us, mm -hmm. and it was. Um, it was a very congenial atmosphere. That's good. How did you, t how did you take to Ethiopian fare? Did you enjoy their I'm food? I'm not a. I'm not a great fond of, of or great connoisseur of Watton and Chera. Uh, if that's what there is to eat, I'm going to eat it and enjoy it. But it's not something that I really go out of my way for. Now we had the uh, we had the Watt Club, which was um, a group of faculty that would eat um, uh, supper with the students one night a week, because the evening meal was always Watt and Jera. And um, then afterwards they'd assemble at somebody's house and have dessert. And uh, what was it they called the, the guys sweetie that just came pies. from? Sweetie Pies. Yeah, Sweetie Pies. We had the Sweetie Pies that they only came for dessert. <laughs> I didn't participate in that, uh, but um, my first real experience with this, uh, one of the farmers that I worked with, and this was very early on after we got there, invited us to his daughter's wedding and uh, a wedding is a feast time and we arrived and, and uh, my Ethiopian counterpart uh, went with us as an interpreter and, and uh, so we sat down and, and uh, instead of sitting at the 
usual little matab sort of thing that they sit on the floor and you reach in with your hand. Well, there was a, a regular table and chairs and uh, there were some other Europeans uh, that had been invited. And so they fed us a, a seven course continental dinner. Oh, now wait. No, they started out, they served us a, a regular Ethiopian dinner. Uh, and there was Watton and Jera and uh, 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 Alicia and I don't know what all and, and um, Tej and Tella, uh, which are drinks. At any rate, I mean, very elaborate spread. And we sat there and ate our fill. And then after, you know, the meal was done, they cleared all of that away. And just on the chance that we didn't really like Ethiopian food and were still hungry, they brought out this seven course continental dinner. And we had to sit there and eat that too. Uh, and we might not like Tej, which is, is a, a honey wine, or Tella, which is a, a home brew beer. Uh, and I have to preface this that uh, when they give you something to drink, they fill the glass to the point that it overflows. So all of a sudden here comes iced tea glasses and a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> and they pour glasses of whiskey oh, no. to overflowing. <laughs> and I try to say, well, you know, really, I don't drink whiskey. I don't care for it. And my Ethiopian fellow leans over to me and very quietly says, drink it. <laughs> <laughs> so we sat there for hours <laughs> sipping at this tumbler full of white horse whiskey. That fellow, I, I eventually, in my relations with him over time, I finally convinced him that I did not drink whiskey. But they have a, a white lightning that they drink, and, and we had, were at the farm one day, and they, the workers were around, and, and the farmer was there, and they drug out uh, a jug of white lightning and started passing that around. <laughs> and he knew that I didn't drink or like that sort of stuff, so that if I had something to drink, they had bought a case of Fanta, that little orange drink in those little bitty bottles. Mm -hmm. And so as the jug came around, I had to drink a Fanta. I sat there and drank three quarters of a case of Fanta while these guys passed that white lightning jug. <laughs> I tell you, that's no more fun than drinking white lightning. Yeah. <laughs> but did, uh, did she ever know about your escapades there? Did you ever tell her? <laughs> oh yeah, she knows that story at any rate. Uh, and when we went to the wedding, all of those things she always went along and so she's familiar with <laughs> with all of those kinds of things but uh, that was uh, uh, part of the cultural mm. acculturation process uh, that well you look back on with some humor and certainly with some fondness and, and remembering the uh, the generosity and the grace of these people uh, toward you as a guest in their home as well as a guest in their country. 
did you did you bring any do you still enjoy Ethiopian food or do you ever have a chance to get uh, it? Or? Uh, oh yes, uh, there are some restaurants around that and we've been to but uh, there are we have Ethiopian friends in town mm -hmm. and um, when their children graduate from high school or college or whatnot there's going to be a feast and then so we'll go and eat Watton and Jarrah with them uh, on those occasions uh, or uh, she she likes it uh, and we'll go out of her way to have some which is fine uh, but we haven't been to an Ethiopian restaurant now in a long time but uh, <coughs> excuse me I understand there is one in Oklahoma City. Yes. It's pretty good. That's Conrad what I recommended it in your Yes, record. he did. <laughs> How did you maintain contact with your family back in the States? Uh, uh, through, uh, through the mails. Uh, we had APO privileges, and so uh, we, could, uh, we didn't have to depend upon the, the international mail uh, necessarily. Uh, but we got mail both ways, uh, both through the international postal system as well as the Army Postal uh, Service. You, you were over there four years, so you had two contracts, is that correct? Yes. And between the two contracts, did you come back to the States? Yes, then? we came back on home leave one summer, 1964. What, how long did it take for you to get back? Did you? Well, let's see. Yeah, the home leave, the home leave year, we planned our our trip so that we went around the world. <coughs> Could you now sh share uh, with us that the yeah um, the contract was set up so that uh, we could travel to and from by the most direct route for uh, go first class or you could take that amount of money and divert as long as you didn't backtrack uh, and so for that amount of money uh, we could get uh, a ticket that would take us around the northern hemisphere and so we took a trip starting with uh, in Deirdawa and we went across to uh, the Arabian Peninsula and in Aden and from Aden we went to India and India we went to uh, Hong Kong oh, that's yeah. and then we stopped <laughs> in, in uh, Hawaii uh, and then came to the States and spent our time at home and then we went back through Stockholm to visit some friends from Michigan State days and then uh, from there uh, to Frankfurt and then on into uh, Ethiopia on Ethiopian Airlines. Did, did you have much time in any of those places? Like how long were you in India? Well, we were in, in, in India, we probably spent the better part of a week. Uh, and we visited uh, the New Delhi and the Agra area. And just by happenstance, we got to spend uh, uh, some time in Calcutta. Uh, but I won't go into that. We saw the Taj Mahal. Yeah, but we saw the Taj and the Red Fort in New Delhi and uh, got to visit uh, the New Delhi area mm -hmm. in particular uh, and that was well it was a pleasant trip uh, then from there we went to Hong Kong and we spent what three days there I suppose yeah the better part of three days and was, Hong Kong then wasn't uh, Hong Kong was in a British Crown Colony. Yeah, but it wasn't skyscrapers like it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Or, or, it a, it, they're bumper to bumper. Yeah. I mean, high. Uh, that's uh, 
so it, you know, we, yeah, we got to see the city in the harbor and do the shops and, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things. Uh, uh, and eat in the restaurants and, you know, just the usual tourist yes. sort of things that, that one would do. And then from there we went to Hawaii and we spent about five days in Hawaii, just, you know, going to the beach, mm -hmm. and driving or touring around the island and so on and, and uh, resting up and having a good time. And the kids were, were, uh, uh, were having a good time playing on the, the sand uh, on the beach and, and uh, well, we, I guess, mentioning the kids. We have five children, mm -hmm. and uh, the youngest one uh, was actually born in Deirdawa. And so this was her first trip home oh. to us, at any rate. And then, and I'll even diverge a little bit on this, when we actually came back at the end of our uh, contract, she kept hanging on to her mama because we had always talked about her as our little Ethiopian baby. And it finally came out, are you going to take me with you? Because I'm an Ethiopian baby. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we took her with us. Yes. <laughs> uh, but we were making this trip with five children. <laughs> What were the age ranges? How old was your oldest? The oldest would have been at that time. Ten or eleven. Well, on home leave, she would have been twelve, and the youngest one would have been two. Got a handful there. <laughs> yeah, but they were. They were. Travelers. They traveled well uh, and you go through Asia in particular folks just love children and they just we, we never had to worry about those kids there was always a uh, somebody kind of keeping an eye on them mm -hmm. or, or knowing that these children belong to us and uh, they would entertain them too, for that matter. And I guess that does. They discovered room service. Oh yes, they <laughs> discovered room service. That's an expensive <laughs> habit to get into. I'm gonna. But at any rate, that that was our home leave summer. Can I can I ask this question? What do you think your Ethiopian experience had on your children? Like, what did they learn? They loved it. They wanted to go back. Yeah. They. Um, How do you think it shaped them? Um. I think in later life, um, it gave them a it gave them a greater appreciation uh, of the world. Uh, they've all traveled uh, out of the country, uh, which is not a common thing. Uh, two sons married Europeans. Um, And I think too that, that as a result of that they've they have a better sense of, uh, of the global aspect of civilization. Um, they certainly look back on that as one of the of the happy times in their life and just the freedom 
of being on that campus and also knowing that they were protected. I mean, that, that, uh, the, the whole community knew who those children were and uh, they kept an eye on them. And uh, we didn't necessarily have to keep a, a finger on them all day long. And they, they de have developed lifelong friendships with the other children that were there at the same time that they were. Did you travel within Africa at all? Not, not too much. Uh, we, um, we stopped over in Cairo when we came home and spent a few days in Cairo. Did you see the pyramids? Uh, or? Yeah, we saw the pyramids and, and um, went out on the desert and went through the museums. And, but mostly we rested. <laughs> yeah. How, how did you, did you have a vehicle when you were on campus? Yes, we bought a car after we got there. What kind of car was that? It was an Opal station wagon. Opal station wagon? Yep. Yeah. From Germany. Trying to, I was trying to think where that came from. Yeah. It was nice and we. Yeah. But, you know, I, I also had a, a, a Jeep that I bought from uh, one of my colleagues that was coming home. And so I had a, a four-wheel drive vehicle uh, as well as the station wagon. Now, that station wagon went almost everywhere my Jeep went, except for a few places that I wouldn't have. I'm not too sure I should have gone with that Jeep, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> She's shaking her head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we did, as uh, entertainment, we went camping a lot. Mm. Yeah. Did you hunt? Yes, uh, my brother loaned me a rifle and uh, I shipped it in in pieces through the APO. Um, but um, I wouldn't, I hunt to eat. I, mm -hmm. I really didn't, I didn't trophy hunt. Okay. I, I did get a leopard. And I skinned that thing out and, and brought it back and had it tanned and preserved and then my son out in New Mexico has it now. Uh, I had an owl, a, a crocodile skin, but I don't know what ever happened to that. And uh, uh, some of the, the antelope that I killed, I kept some of the horns, but not a rack or mm. whatever. Not a hat. No. Uh, but it was possible uh, I could come home a, a little early and, and fix some sandwiches and get in my Jeep and, and head out to uh, one of the valleys on the other side of the city of Harar had a dry riverbed and you could drive up and down the dry riverbed and with a spotlight you could spot uh, kudu which was the antelope that we was most prevalent. So I could get my sandwiches and go uh, watch the sun go down and, and or you get out there and watch the sun go down and eat my sandwiches and wait for it to get good dark and make a run down the, the dry river bed and uh, get a kudu and um, throw it on top of the jeep and be back home by nine o'clock that night uh, and then you know I process it and, and we put it in the freezer mm. and my daughter always complained that she didn't like to eat after I'd been hunting because she didn't know what she's eating. But then <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I hunted some, but I, I really did not trophy hunt. What, what other artifacts or objects that you brought back? What kind of things that you brought back? Well, my wife can talk about that better than I can because okay. she's a collector. 
and she likes baskets, so we have a lot of basketry that we we brought back. Um, but I, I, she can address that much better okay. than I can. We'll get that on Wednesday. Now switching gears into the political sense, Ooh. our political world, politics, that type of thing. Yeah. Did you? At, during your time there, did you see any remnants of the Italian invasion? Uh, yeah. Um, the the Ethiopians welcomed the Italians after um, uh, the war, uh, and so there were a lot of Italians in the country. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the fellows. Um, uh, Mario um, was a, an employee of the college uh, in helping run the maintenance facilities and, and so forth. Um, the other thing that you, if you had the curiosity, um, the roads in the rural areas um, weren't too well maintained, but um, a lot of those roads had been built by the Italians. Uh, I, I've heard it said that while they were there, in the four years that, uh, that they were there, they built a kilometer of road a day. Uh, and there are a lot of those roads still there, and, and are you know primary arteries uh, for um, farmers to get to market. Mm -hmm. But when um, when the Italians were driven out, they blew the bridges. Not the Italians; the Ethiopians blew the bridges. Uh, the philosophy being that if you blew the bridges, then the Italians couldn't come back, uh, or it would be more difficult. Mm -hmm. And so they, a lot of them, they never rebuilt. And so uh, travel in the rainy season could be uh, hit and miss, uh, depending upon whether the water was up in the washes. And uh, we had some experiences with that. Uh, uh, we never really had to wait overnight, but uh, we did have to wait at a number of washes or get some help mm -hmm. uh, to get uh, down the road. Well, they were the typical. Yeah, but they were the old typical Roman arch type of, of bridge, and there was a, a beautiful old bridge on the way up to the rainforest, and it just sat out there in the middle of nowhere. and. Instead of having a bridge to go over, while well, you kind of went down the embankment and, and went through a, a low water crossing uh, in order to, to get on your way. Uh, other remnants, um, a lot of the a lot of the power plants uh, in the, the rural areas were remnants of the Italian occupation, I think. Uh, I know the, the power plant that supplied the, the campus uh, was probably uh, a leftover from the, the Italian days. There was uh, a spaghetti factory. Yeah, and there was a... Uh, you know. the, one of the local breweries was uh, uh, an Italian operation, but uh, they were very much present in the country, and the Italians, because a lot of them were uh, technically competent people, uh, at one time the Italians had a, a, a program to try to repatriate uh, a lot of those Italian technicians, particularly, that lived in Ethiopia. Uh, but it, it didn't work well because they had lived there a long time, uh, they had families, uh, their roots were down, and uh, they, 
other than occasional trips back, they, they really didn't know Italy anymore. How did you hear about the Kennedy assassination? <laughs> okay. Uh, my next door neighbor, Jack Mosley, uh, had a shortwave radio and uh, he always listened to the BBC at uh, it was around nine o'clock at night, our time. And uh, he, uh, he got the news over the radio and he ran next door and I remember me, he didn't just knock, he pounded on our front door. And I opened the door, and he just kind of blurted out, Kennedy's been shot. And so we went over and listened to the BBC for a little while. Uh, maybe Armed Forces Radio. But that's how we heard about it. And uh, we were expecting a visit from the Emperor hmm. the next day or the day after. I don't know. At any rate, his visit was imminent. And um, uh, he just canceled that, got on his airplane, and, and went to Washington. And um, then after all of those uh, ceremonies were out of the way, he came and did make a visit and, and express his sympathy and condolences to us. But uh, I think the invited to, to his house. Yeah, but the most impressive thing, I think, was that um, they came to us and uh, asked if we wanted to fly the American flag. And so we were permitted to put up a, a, a flagpole and fly the Stars and Stripes at half staff during the uh, funeral ceremonies for Kennedy, uh, which is a very magnanimous thing, I think. And it certainly was a, a, a comforting thing for us Americans that were there. Then he had a reception for all the Americans. When he yeah, back. yeah, that's right. But he was a, the emperor was a very gracious host. I was just getting into those questions the, yeah, about during the entire time that we were in the country. And, uh, How many times did you meet with him? Well, we would meet with him every time that he came to visit. And as I said earlier, he'd visit anywhere from one to three times a year. Uh, he would visit our area and the military academy was close by and so he would visit there as well as he had other uh, government business to take of, care of in the area and so he'd always make a visit to the campus and, and so that was a formal occasion. And uh, uh, he wanted to tour the facility each time that he was there and so uh, I had the poultry area and uh, others had the, the dairy and others had agronomy and, and horticulture and, and you know whatever and he wanted to visit each one of those so we always had to prepare some kind of presentation uh, at the site of the facility and so uh, we'd always visit with him when he'd come to our portion of the facilities. Uh, and the, the thing that, that struck me, uh, at any rate, um, he always knew what he talked to you about the last time yeah. you were there, or he was there. And uh, he remembered a, a lot of what you had talked about at that time, plus he, he kind of always asked, well, what are you planning on and this sort of thing, and he'd ask about, well, now are you planning such and so, where are you on that uh, kind of thing. Uh, 
and um, he either had somebody that kept good notes and briefed him very thoroughly before he came to visit or he had one heck of a memory. <laughs> but it, that always impressed me that, at least in my case, he always was uh, familiar with what we had talked about and what we were planning to do. Well, he really cared about the college. Yeah. What, was it? Did, was the college a source of pride for him, or? Oh yes, that was um, uh, that was one of the things that I think he was most interested in. Now he was interested in the university. Um, he took a lot of heat from um, um, the royal dukes and earls and whatever else that there was. And many of them were not very well educated people anyway. And um, did not really uh, support him in his efforts to improve education in the country. But his concept was that he would build the universities and get the people trained and you know, train their own people and build their own faculties with the intent that they were the ones that were going to go out into the uh, hinterlands of the country and have an impact. And they have done that. And I think it, it's it's to the credit of the Ethiopians, whether they, it was uh, the uh, emperor's regime or that of the communists or of the, the uh, dictator that's in there at the present time, uh, they have fell, held pretty fast to that policy. And um, for uh, good or ill, uh, they have been very successful in establishing uh, higher education in the country. Uh, and uh, I know in, in the case of Alamaya, uh, I think the the quality of students has been and remains good, um, and certainly uh, a number of the well the philosophy that we put in there is, is with the land grant system and the work ethic that we uh, introduced in the training of of our students while we were there uh, has carried over. Uh, we had a yeah, uh, we had a gentleman here on campus not too long ago from Purdue mm -hmm. that was a graduate of Alamaya College and that was in, in his discussions and, and talks to uh, people here on campus that was one of the things that he emphasized that and that that seems to have carried over and I know um, in visiting with um, uh, Ethiopian students that have come from Alamaya since we left there and been on campus and so forth uh, uh, I, I, I still sense the, the dedication um, the seriousness with which they take their work while they're here uh, um, very much I think an outgrowth of what we were able to, to do in those initial stages in getting the College of Agriculture established. So uh, that's all part of that warm, fuzzy thing that I talked about a little How bit How many earlier. students did you have when we were there? Well, now, when we were there, we only had a student body of 250. Mm -hmm. Males. And all males. Now, uh, they have a student body of, uh, of 20,000. Uh, and there are... Half and half males. Yeah, there, it, it's a co-educational institution. And uh, there are three or four other colleges 
on the campus now, mm -hmm. besides agriculture. So, uh, but I never really finished my thought that, that with all of those changes in government and, and the adversity that grew up uh, around that, the, the Ethiopians have carried through and maintained and grown <coughs> excuse me uh, the institutions of higher learning in the country uh, uh, Alamaya being one of the fine example of what they've done they kept them open during the revolutions and the uh, <coughs> intrigues and whatever, but they, they kept mm -hmm. the colleges and, and the universities open and functioning, and uh, it will make a difference for them. So it's, uh, OSU can take a, a, a lot of pride in what was accomplished at Alamaya as far as the country of Ethiopia is concerned. Now, I know Dr. Wilhelm yep. made trips over there. Yes. Did you ever meet with him and discuss? Well, what Dr. Wilhelm is a Cotton County boy. <laughs> so, yes, I know. I know Oliver Wilhelm. Well, <laughs> and, he, uh, uh, and he visited the campus several times while I was there. Maybe, could you just briefly describe his personality for us? Um, he was proud uh, of being a country boy. Yep. Yeah. But Dr. Wilhelm, I guess if you kind of look back into the, the definition of a gentleman from the 18th and early 19th century, um, He was a gentle man, uh, and a very gracious, very personable, um, outgoing um, individual. Uh, the first time that I ever met him, uh, I had come up from Cameron to look at the possibilities of going to school at, at uh, a and m and he was Dean of Agriculture at the time. And uh, my friend and I were standing at the receptionist's desk as he came out of his office. Uh, and he stopped and, and uh, visited with Kendall and I for several minutes. And then when he learned we were from Cotton County, why well, he related his growing up over around Ranelette and so forth. Right. And, uh, uh, made us feel, you know, very good about being on the campus. Well, it was three years later that I actually got on campus, and Oliver Wilhelm called me by name and knew where I came from. <laughs> um, but he was, he was that kind of person. Uh, he always made you feel good around him, uh, and uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, a tremendous leader, tremendous leader, uh, but a very quiet uh, sort of man, and certainly a, a very gracious. Boy, I use that term a lot, uh, but he was. Uh, <laughs> He, he was a man that, that you would remember. What kind of influence did he have on the Ethiopian project? Oh, I, I, I think he was, um, As you look at the way that a president of a university has to divide their attention in terms of the various priorities of the institution, 
this is something that he took interest in. Um, I, I, and I think too he he was proud of what was going on over there, but he he pretty much left the project to those that were involved in it. Uh, he would come to visit, but he he came to visit basically just to see what was going on and letting people know that as the chief administrator of the institution that had the, the responsibility for fulfill, fulfilling the contract that he was staying aware of what was going on. But uh, he didn't have anything to do with the running of the project per se. Have you maintained relationships with those you met from your time in Ethiopia? such as Ethiopians themselves? Yeah. Uh, not to the extent that Conrad has. Uh, but we've, we've still got two very close friends uh, from Ethiopia in the United States. Um, August Keflamarian. No, August Kefel. Uh, he was the um, procurement officer at Alamaya, and we got to know him and his family quite well. And um, uh, he has immigrated to the states. And as a matter of fact, yeah, we talked to Hogos this week. Uh, or like, yeah, Easter. Just you know, exchanging Easter greetings. Then uh, Tashoma Wonderfresh, who uh, uh, lives uh, in the D.C. area, and um, well, as a matter of fact, we stayed with him when we went back for the um, inauguration of the uh, Native American Museum in the, the Smithsonian, and. Um, we, well, we have phone contact with them mm -hmm. several times through the year. And so those are the two folks that, that we know the best. Um, there are some others that we are acquainted with and, you know, we'll see them from time to time. But most of our contacts with the Ethiopians have been through the uh, the Oklahoma Ethiopian Association, uh, and its uh, reunions and activities uh, over time, and uh, well, acquainted with uh, Telehum Yoma out of Davis, you know, and, and some of those mm -hmm. folks. Uh, we had uh, when I was in Nebraska. Um, Gatermu Haile, who was president of the college in Owasa. Uh, we got very well acquainted with him and his family. Um, he's since passed away, but um, yeah, okay. we've kept contact uh, with people and, and have kept aware of things that are going on in Ethiopia. Uh, Desalem. Desalem. Oh yeah, Desalem was here. And uh, he got very involved in the, in the current political aspects of the country. And he was a good person to talk to from the standpoint of, of well, opposition to the current government. Is there a bond between those faculty members that were part of the Ethiopian project? A, a bond? A, a bond. Yes. There is very much a bond between the folks that were there. Uh, 
you're probably aware that we hold a reunion every two years, just about. Our group is getting smaller, uh, but and through the year we maintain contact with one another uh, in greater or lesser degree. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we came back to Stillwater uh, to retire is that there are a number of those Ethiopian families that um, we were with uh, in, in Ethiopia. Well, of course there's the Evanses and the Wagners and the Wells and, and, uh, and some others that are here in the community, others that have passed away. There are others that live in, in Tulsa and so forth. Uh, so that uh, coming to Stillwater was not coming to a strange place. Mm -hmm. uh, and partly because of the friendship that existed between us and those that were in Ethiopia uh, back in the mid-60s. Is there any other, is there any other topics that we should discuss that we haven't touched upon about your Ethiopian experience that come to mind offhand, or we could wait till Wednesday? I guess I could think a little bit more about it, but no. Um, There are a lot of stories that I could that I could relate, but I suspect that you got most of those kinds of things from Conrad already. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we could talk about trips that we took in the country, or we could talk about camping trips or uh, campus activities uh, or community activities that we got involved in. I, I guess I would raise that. The students. Village uh, school. Yeah. Now, I guess I'll start there. Pat Murphy, who was a soil scientist mm -hmm. here, uh, helped the students start what was called the village school. There, there just wasn't any school for children in the area around the campus. And uh, Pat had started uh, teaching his yard boy to read and write. And uh, the boy's father came to see, well, what are you doing with my kid? And he said, well, hey, would you teach me? Mm -hmm. And out of that, um, uh, Pat organized the students and they actually established a school and the students uh, were the instructors in the school and you know built around their class schedules and so forth why well, you'd see the kids or the students going off campus to where we had a, a, a little school building for them and then one year Crossroads Africa, I think it was, came in with a group of, of folks and they built a cinder block multi-room school uh, just outside the gate to the, to the campus. Uh, but now, that was something that, yes, one of our faculty members helped students. The students picked up on it and took it and, and uh, established a neighborhood school. Uh, now, to, and we would help them. Uh, if they needed money or whatnot, we'd have some kind of a fundraising thing. And I remember one time we, we put on a, a variety show. And we had songs and dances and I don't know what all. At, at any rate, uh, we did it on campus, mm -hmm. and we did invite people from around the community, and we charged admission. And uh, 
it was so well received that um, the Greek church in Deridawa uh, had an auditorium and they invited us down to perform our variety show uh, in the city of Deridawa. Uh, and you know, that was an activity It took us quite a bit to get you know rehearsed and prepared and whatnot. So over a period of maybe uh, three or four weeks, uh, that was a, a big social and activity outlet for us mm -hmm. uh, and a way in which to kind of show something of uh, the American culture uh, other than what they saw in the movies. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, now, where did I get started on this? Uh, Another thing that we did um, that was, you know, an entertainment thing for the whole campus that was typically non-Ethiopian. Uh, it was Christmas time and um, record players were at, at home were something that we used for entertainment and uh, some of us had uh, collections of Handel's Messiah and uh, we were all used to the, the little kids Christmas thing at the church or at the school or uh, uh, at any rate the little tableaus mm -hmm. and whatnot of the uh, Christmas events and so the suggestion was well let's uh, uh, record on a separate tape the music from the Messiah that is associated with the Christmas and um, then we'll get together and then we'll have the Ethiopians to uh, help us and of course we've got donkeys and camels and cattle and sheep and uh, all of this to do the manger and the the shepherds in the field and, and you know all of that kind of thing and our campus was situated on a hill and so uh, we kind of had a natural amphitheater that we could uh, put this on and so uh, we did we put this all together and uh, uh, Conrad helped us and we built a star to come out of the east and then rigged it up so that we could pull it on a pulley thing and it would come <laughs> out of the east yeah. and, and rest over the the manger and and you know all of these kinds of things so we had uh, uh, the had angels. They had angels and then the Gabriel's uh, encounter with Mary and the Immaculate Conception and, and we had this the shepherds uh, in the in the field by night and uh, the wise men mm -hmm. and you know the the whole smear and um, then we had uh, we made arrangements with the local folks and they brought their camels mm -hmm. in and, and uh, we had donkeys to uh, fill in on the scenes and all this sort of thing and uh, the veterinarian had some tranquilizer that he could use so that we could keep the sheep in place. <laughs> but he didn't have enough tranquilizer to do dress rehearsal and, and the real thing. And so uh, the night of the, of the performance he tranquilized them and he overdosed them. <laughs> they were all out there just laying down. Oh God. <laughs> At the dress rehearsal, we we mistakenly tied the donkey to the to the actual manger, and it got spooked, and so yeah. here it goes running off down the road with the manger and the, and the baby Jesus. And <laughs> 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 uh, 
but you know the performance itself was really very impressive. Uh, Ababa was one of the um, angels. We had a blonde hair and the Ethiopian. Oh yeah, that was nice. Dr. Kendall's wife was a uh, uh, statuesque blonde, perfect angel. She was scared to death of the camels. And lo and behold, in the manger scene, here she is with the camel's head sticking over her shoulder. <laughs> she managed to get through it. And uh, I've forgotten now, one of the Ethiopian ladies played the part of Mary. And, uh, but, you know, mm -hmm. All of the staff got together Coming and together. did this thing and presented it that to the student neat. body. And then we invited the general public from uh, uh, yeah, around yeah. the college, Deirdre and Harar. The governor came over and, and uh, the folks out of, uh, particularly the Christian churches out of Deirdre came up. So we had a nice crowd. And uh, of course we had good music and there you go. so on, so it was a... And we turned off all the lights. Oh yeah, we were able to turn off all the nice. lights so that our star came out of the dark and then it got stuck halfway. <laughs> so. But, you know, I could tell you story mm -hmm. after story of, of those kinds of things. Uh, but I don't know that that's what you're really trying to yeah. do here. So, I guess this is probably a good stopping point for right now. Okay. And we'll see you on Wednesday. Yes. I do appreciate this interview. We've gone nearly three hours here. So. Oh my. I didn't know we'd be that long. <laughs>